introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, this month, we brought you Doug Bierend. Bieren. I hope I'm saying it correctly. Um, and I'm going to start off by using one of the quotes that he put in the book that I really liked and admire. And um, Doug Bierend is neither a mycologist nor a scientist. Instead, he's a humble enthusiast when it comes to fungi. In fact, in his book, he questions the idea of being an expert and who gets to participate and make contributions. In the world of mycology, many are invited to communicate, innovate, create, and otherwise do beautiful things with or about fungi. Um, he has hope is to uplift a variety of work in ways related to fungi conducted by people of diverse backgrounds, identities, and experiences rooted in respectful partnership with, um, with the massive, vital, and often overlooked dimensions of the living world. So, you know, as the, we continue this mushroom boom, one of those things is um, really that anybody can get involved. So it doesn't matter where you start off. And the important part is that you start. And another one of the quotes I would like to read is, um, Picking any point of nature to examine should lead one to the same vast and endlessly entangled picture, albeit from a different vantage point. But fungi seem uniquely alluring messengers. So um, I definitely agree. This is one of the aspects that really can help our environment. So we're gonna find out a little bit more about it. Um, Doug has the la around the last decade or so, and he's written with special interest in science, technology, visual and interactive media, food, sustainability, and general submersiveness. He is a freelance writer, and this is his first, uh, first time author based out of the Hudson Valley. He has a bachelor's in journalism with a minor in philosophy from the California State University of Northridge. He's also been a writer for the New York News, an editorial assistant at Juilliard School, uh, a blogger for Wired, a contribution editor with Advantage, and has been a, been a freelance writer for pitching articles and writing with Wired, Vice, The Atlantic, Motherboard, The Counter, Civil Eads, and a lot, lot more. Um, you're able to connect with him via Twitter, Instagram, or his website. And one thing too, I would love to mention is um, the publishing company uh, with Chelsea Green because um, they were founded in 1984 and they're recognized as one of the leading publisher of books of politics and practices of sustainable living, publishing authors who bring in-depth and practical knowledge to life and give readers a hands-on information related to organic farming, gardening, ecology, environment, healthy food, sustainable economics and progressive politicals, and now with integrative health and wellness. They're also an uh, employee-owned company. And one of the, the things that I like most is that um, they're committed to being sustainable business enterprise. So 95% of their books are printed on recycled paper with at least 30% post-consumer waste um, or 100 when it's possible. So this company not only wants to really help uh, bring information out to the forefront, um, but they're doing it in a very, very sustainable way. Um, so they're members of the Press Initiative. So it's a nonprofit organized dedicated to increasing the use of recycled paper in book industry. So in general, this whole book is really um, as another way to understand, learn, and really being able to help our environment. Um, for those that didn't get the book, we get 30, 20, 35% off with the SD Micro website uh, discount code. And just to let you know, there's also a spring clearance going on right now that's 85% off um, for other selected books. So um, if you guys haven't checked it out, please do so. It's a really great company. So no wonder Doug has chosen them for as the publishing firm um, or so, but um, yeah. Without any further ado, Doug, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's really a pleasure to have you and to learn a little bit more about the background of your book. So um, whenever you're ready. 
All right. Well, thanks so much for having me. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I just want to make sure that I have the uh, screen sharing situation all settled because uh, I know we tested it, but suddenly it's not providing me my notes like it did last time. So I'm going to play for time here while I figure this out and just say thanks again for having me. Um, this is a real treat. Um, as some of you who've read the book may know, it takes place in part in San Diego at uh, the World Beat Cultural Center, which you may be familiar with, some of you. Um, and I am really uh, I love that introduction because it seems like the, the themes I was hoping to get at with this book are really resonant with this group. And, and I'm never quite sure where people are at, you know, what kind of approach or, or relationship they have to this subject. So um, I'm excited even more so than before to talk to you because I get the sense uh, that this is exactly the right audience for it. Um, I can't seem to find my notes on this, so I'm just gonna start and, uh, and go for it. Um, bear with me. All right, are you able to see that? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so, In Search of Mycotopia is the name of the book. Um, I guess maybe a little context on what I, what, what that title means. Um, Mycotopia is, uh, you know, it's the name of a, an online forum for psilocybin mushroom cultivation techniques. It's the name of a, it's used a lot by, by certain folks. Uh, Mushroom Mountain, where we'll, we'll see in the photos, uh, calls itself Mycotopia. Um, but for me, it was sort of a synonym for utopia. And it has to do with a lot of the talk I hear around mushrooms about how they will save the world or save us, which is kind of what I think that actually means. And we'll get into that a little bit. Um, so I went looking for it, you could say. And this is, I think, what most people might um, think of when they think of mushroom culture. It's uh, ob obviously an Amanita muscaria mushroom uh, in truck form. Um, and there's a certain hippie vibe, um, maybe people of a certain age. Um, I think a lot of times people think of mushrooms and mushroom culture as a kind of uh, throwback thing. But what I was finding is that it's, it's a pretty vital and modern, um, I would call it a movement, but um, I, there may be a technical reason not to. Um, I actually found an Amanita that was in Colorado um, at the Telluride Mushroom Festival. And I had the secret hope of finding an Amanita um, and I did. So it felt like the mushrooms were answering my, my, uh, my desires throughout this process. And by the way, um, I hope you'll forgive me because I'm kind of improvising now that I don't have my notes. Uh, this presentation, I guess, especially if, if you've not read the book yet, hopefully we'll give you a little bit of just visual reference um, to some of the things I talk about, some of the places I go and people I meet. Um, I'm hoping to make this a sort of tour of some of the concepts and uh, themes that, that I touch on in the book. So um, while you're reading, I hope that some of these photos will come to mind. And this is a uh, common theory that we hear among mushroom people, that mushrooms uh, came from another planet. Um, of course, I, I tend to think it's more profound um, and probably more true to recognize that they are close, you know, they're earthly, as earthly as us, and that we're relatives of them, along with plants and every other living thing. Um, so I tend to, to push this theory off a bit, but, but this is sort of the character of a lot of the mushroom spaces you might find. My introduction to this world was actually a little more like this, at this um, nondescript warehouse in Rochester, New York, um, the home of Smugtown Mushrooms. That's Olga right there on the side, and uh, she is the founder and proprietor of this this funky mushroom company upstate that um, I, I actually went up there for this reason, um, is really not all that interested in, in being a big business or, or doing, you know, uh, cornering its market. It's really much more focused on building community. And um, to me, it was a completely new environment full of all sorts of, uh, at the time, alien and uh, uh, intriguing sights and smells. If any of you have been in a mushroom cultivation space, you know that there is some unmistakable smells um, that I have grown quite fond of, actually. Um, and the whole thing was just sort of thrown together, uh, bricolage, you know, uh, borrowed and, and 
improvised shelving and, and um, that's the HEPA filter, or it might be the flow hood um, that maintains, uh, makes sure that particles don't land in the Petri dishes as they are cultivating mushrooms there. A lot of the strains that uh, Olga works with are local. They came from uh, parks and, and you know, nearby forests uh, where she lives. And there's an emphasis on indigeneity when it comes to the strains that, that they work with. And I think that's an example of how some of the, the, the social concepts that, that we hear about uh, around mushrooms uh, are reflected in the organisms themselves and the way that people are trying to like relate to them. Um, I'm growing reishi right now that she gave me that she found near a park bench uh, by her house. So um, on the left is a sterilizer, a, uh, an autoclave, a giant tube basically that sterilizes substrate uh, so that the fungus can eat it without too much competition. Um, Olga's operation, I think, was 2,500 pounds a month, uh, which is pretty sizable, It's uh, but, but quite modest compared to larger operations like you'd find in, especially in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania, which is the mushroom capital of the world, uh, but really more like the mushroom capital of this country. China would be the most likely candidate for mushroom capital of the world. They produce orders of magnitude more than the States does, as far as I understand it. But it's enough for, for her needs and her community's needs. You know, it's a, a constant struggle and a constant hustle, but it's also the, the focus, the focal point of her community or one focal point of her community um, of people who are largely about self-sustainability, about breaking free of inequitable, unsustainable systems. And they might name it capitalism. I might name it capitalism. I, I don't want to speak for them. It's not a political space or anything like that, but there are definite attitudes that you can kind of pick up just by the way that people present themselves. Another one of the values that, that people are seizing upon when it comes to fungi is their uh, waste reduction ability, their abilities to turn outputs into inputs. It's a sort of permaculture concept. Um, that, and there's a reason permaculture is spoken of a lot in these mycological circles. These are grains from a brewery next door to Smugtown that were turned into fungus food, which were turned into food for people, which the substrate of which was turned into compost. And so they're trying to build virtuous cycles. And I, again, I think they're easy social reflections to kind of draw from that. Um, for me though, the real revelation came when Olga took me and my friend uh, Alana into the woods to look for mushrooms. And it was the first time I had ever done that. Um, I used to hang out you know, at the edge of the lawn at, in grade school and check out the snails and the mushrooms and stuff. I was kind of a loner big surprise, but uh, I never really like looked for mushrooms or, or considered what they were um, besides just some weird thing that you're not supposed to eat and probably not supposed to touch. Um, I was completely disabused of that notion. This was back in 2015, by the way. So this was kind of right at the outset. I had, well, I'll get into that in a sec. Um, on this walk, the entire forest was sort of re, it was presented to me anew. Um, I saw things that I had no, had no idea existed um, in abundance and all around me because I was with someone who knew how to see them. And so I was given my eyes as some people say. Um, and that's a, uh, believe again, a derma aplanatum, an artist conch, which um, let's see if this works. There we go. You can actually draw on them in case any of you aren't aware. Um, I know that's not the best use of <laughs> that opportunity, but that's, Kind of cool and people do amazing artworks with these uh, mushrooms that's lion's mane You're just growing out of a woodpecker tree and a uh, woodpecker hole in that tree um, we took that home and ate it so there was this sense of abundance that that also sank in during this i guess two hour walk in the forest um, in the book i think i describe it as uh, seeing the place light up like a pinball machine and obviously mushrooms kind of look like parts of a pinball machine but um I've found myself telling people that uh, if you go into the forest and you don't see the plants or you don't see animals, you're really missing the forest. And I think the same can be said for fungi, which are just as uh, uh, fundamental and prominent in the ecosystem there. And, and especially if you know how to look for them, you, you find that they are everywhere. Um, but we just aren't really, most of us, uh, or maybe that's not even fair to say, but certainly most people I know um, aren't trained or, or acculturated to look for these things uh, or to recognize them. And 
so to me that was sort of the big uh revelation and, and it changed my life i think um as silly as that might sound i think people here might understand what i mean um obviously sniffing mushrooms is one of the best ways to get to know them um all this talk about nature and uh you know uh, rediscovering the forest doesn't mean that these folks aren't hustling this is uh the the van full of fungus to be taken down to Pennsylvania for a mushroom festival. Um, it is a business after all here, are the oyster mushrooms that they uh, cultivate. And I'm going to tune what I'm doing a bit to the recognition that you all are, like I said before, I think pretty hip to a lot of this stuff. So um, the other step that, that sort of cemented this all for me was taking mushrooms home. Those are those reishi I'm talking about. I'm working with the same strain six years later now. Um, that I bought at different occasions from from Smugtown and spending time and space with fungus um, is not something I ever thought I would do or find myself talking about, but um, I think it was a big part of coming into a relationship with with fungi, a fungal fellowship, as I call it in the book. Um, these are the first mushrooms I grew with my own effort, a straw that I sourced from a, uh, an equestrian center in Jamaica, Queens. Um, and sterilized in lye and or uh, lime rather, and I used again Smugtown's uh, oyster mushroom substrate. And these mushrooms fruited on the very day that I signed the deal for this book. So I took it as a sign that they were giving me a signal, and I ate them. Um, mushroom cultivation can look a lot of different ways. Um, this is a front range fungi um, in Colorado near Denver. Um, that's bad. I, I'm forgetting my friend's name there. I can tell you his last name. If I had my notes, I'd read it to you. But uh, Trevor Garofano is his name. Um, they are no longer around, unfortunately, because of COVID. But their operation was unique um, because it lived in two trailer trucks. And part of what's interesting to me about all of this, uh, all the fungal cultivation activity is, is how adaptable it is and how many ways there are to do it to suit the needs of a community or the uh, whoever's doing it. Um, on the left, you've got a truck dedicated to the lab space and um, incubation. And then on the right is the fruiting chamber. So um, you can see on the left-hand picture, they've cut a chute. They've cut holes into the sides of each of the trucks and just have a chute so they can push the bags from one stage to the next. Um, and they've kind of spread out into the abandoned warehouse that was uh, uh, you know, their home for the time being. Um, to me, it also just had a certain aesthetic quality to it. Uh, to me, it, it represents a lot of what mushroom cultivation kind of is, which is scrappy, improvised, um, bespoke. And one of the other common things about it is that you'll see a lot of spent substrate um, afterwards. These are all blocks. Uh, it looks like maybe shiitake in the middle and oyster uh, on the sides there that are spent. They've produced flushes of mushrooms, maybe two, three. And that doesn't mean that they're not still alive or biologically active. And many people will take those blocks and plant them in their gardens, use them for compost. Um, I visited uh, further south from Denver in Colorado Springs, a friend of mine who um, does landscaping um, with spent substrate blocks and plants them in people's gardens. She planted some in her own garden and they produced these mushrooms which she sold at the farmer's market and every single one of those ones sold at five bucks a pop. Um, so there's a value add to it. I think there's a lot of interesting things that could be done in gardening when it comes to, to fungi. I feel like that's gonna be a, a burgeoning space, especially as people are starting to grow more of their own food. Um, I think we're gonna probably see that confluence. Uh, here's another uh, example, another scale at which mushroom cultivation can happen. Here's another uh, autoclave and here's the other side of it. This one's in Massachusetts um, at Mycoterra Farm, and they are the largest producer of mushrooms in the state. Um, but according to the founder, Julia Coffey, they only account, I think, for 2% of the state's consumption, which shows you how much of it comes from Pennsylvania and overseas. Um, but automatically, you can see there's just a lot more going on there. And I think they do 5,000 pounds a week, if I don't, I might be getting that wrong, but they do a lot more. Than, uh, than the smaller operations I showed you before. That's uh, black pearl mushrooms, which are increasingly popular. They're a hybrid, I think, of gray oyster and 
King Trumpet or something. Um, and on the other end of the scale, you've got this at home DIY cultivation uh, picture, low tech, no tech. Um, this is Willoughby Aravalo in Vancouver, British Columbia. He's showing us the wine's mane liquid culture that he's uh, prepared. And you can see the mycelium inside has gotten uh, impatient and uh, conspired to move toward the lid, whether it knew uh, <laughs> what it was doing or not, I, I can't say, but um, it's clearly quite vital. Liquid culture, by the way, is a, an increasingly popular just mode of cultivation where um, instead of inoculating spawn or like grains or wood chips or things like that to, to spread the mushroom or the fungus, you um, carefully prepare a liquid nutrient broth that it kind of lives in in a suspended state and then can be quickly applied to all sorts of different substrates. And um, the low tech methods are, they look like this. You, you sterilize the, the glasses in a pressure cooker. You use a glass marble as an agitator. Um, that one says has bacteria on it and he just kept it because he wanted to see what it would do using a, a water heater as an incubator. Um, and I don't think that needs any explanation, but, um, and that's his picture, not mine. But uh, to me, this is the more, uh, intriguing and, and enticing kind of aspect of, of the mushroom cultivation uh, boom. It's that you can do it anywhere. It's a, a really accessible way to produce nutritious food, medicine from spent agricultural products, from ag agricultural waste products. Um, and I think people are finding ways to spur new local economies and, and to provide for themselves and their communities. Um, mushrooms, I feel like, have a, a real role to play in that sort of thing. Um, but then we come to like the capital S science of mycology. And this is in uh, London. This is the Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And they're fungarian. It's the largest fungarian in the world, as far as I know. It's got close to 2 million fungal species all in these boxes. And it's really the basis, uh, it's part of the basis of the global project of taxonomy. Um, people want to know what a mushroom is. The science has done work to to compare and name these things and, and figure out what's what. And all of it comes back to physical specimens in boxes somewhere. And that's what that looks like. This is a, a fungus found by um, Charles Darwin in Tierra del Fuego. And you can see his little signature there on that middle uh, slip of paper. I just thought that was really cool. That's a ram's head with um, an ascomycete fungus, I believe, uh, sheathing its horns um, alongside uh, marmite and some other common fungally infused uh, products, mostly through Saccharomyces yeast. Um, we are all fungus consumers, whether we know it or not. Um, as long as you drink coffee or beer, or eat bread for the most part, or cheese. Um, this is a cordyceps mushroom, which we'll hear about later, but you can see it growing out of a, uh, a caterpillar and it's pretty gnarly, but also quite beautiful. Um, and here is the slime mold drawer, which is just nice to know that exists. It's um, slime molds are not fungus, but they're often confused with them. And in fact, one of the terms for them, Mycetozoa, zoa, is literally fungus animal, which I love because they actually move. Um, and they're more closely, they're more of an amoeba. They're more closely related to something like E. coli than any mushroom we know, but they're, they, they have behaviors and, and traits that are very fascinating. And, um, are researched and, and, and for, for sort of forms of intelligence or apparent memory and intelligence that I think gets them kind of naturally lumped in with the alluring, seemingly intelligent behavior of fungi. Um, this is just a type specimen. I, I, I thought it was cool. This is the, the foundation of, I could tell you that species if I could zoom in right now, but um, it's the foundation of the identification of that species. This is called the type specimen. And it's sort of the, the ground floor of the taxonomy of that um, organism. And so that's the sort of thing that an outfit like Q takes care of and uh, monitors. Um, this is in UC Riverside, that's Danielle Stevenson. Um, she studies uh, uh, arbuscular mycorrhizae um, or AMF. These are fungi that uh, intertwine with the, the root cells of plants. Um, actually break into the cells themselves and form little tree-like um, structures. That's why they're called arbuscular. Um, 
so you look into the cell of a plant. Um, I don't think it's quite visible in this picture, but you can see the, the fungal thread poking out of the side of the, the root. So that gives you a sense of the scale. Um, that large brown column is a root fiber and the blue, it's blue because it's been stained to be visible, is a fungal hyphae, which is in, in, meshed within that root. And um, she is studying it with a special interest in the ability that these fungi have to soak up heavy metals and to otherwise mitigate contaminants um, with an emphasis on like food crops. Um, and that's in contrast to the ways that fungi are often um, assessed and considered, which is as pathogens, as uh, death to trees, to crops, um, houses. And certainly they are formidable foes if uh, they have an interest in something we also have an interest in and we're competing with them. But um, you know, when I saw this, this is in the Uinta Mountains of Utah, I was with a, a person who pointed it out to me and said, you know, these beetles got into the tree, but what really killed it was a fungus. And um, it turns out, as I get into in the book, it's probably not quite that simple, but it is pretty amazing um, that these beetles do transport fungus, uh, the, sometimes in very specific and highly refined relationships. Like the beetle will have special organs called mycangia that the spores can germinate in while it transfers from tree to tree. And it, it's a, it, you could say they're made for each other. It's co-evolution. Um, so it's interesting in that regard, but um, I talked to a Dr. Diana Six who suggests that this may all be part of a kind of ecosystemic level response to stress in which trees that are not susceptible to these beetles and to the higher heat and drought conditions that are creating more uh, swarms of these beetles are actually leading to more resilient forests down the line. Um, it's a hopeful picture and I hope she's right. Um, but all of this is, is really in the context of uh, just a vast lack of knowledge about fungi, about what fungi are even out there. Um, we don't know what we're losing to climate change, to habitat loss, um, and deforestation and whatnot, um, because we just don't know what fungi are out there. And that's owing in part to them not being subjects of much interest or even distinct as a category until the late 60s. Um, which is when fungi were named as a kingdom. But uh, it's also due to institutional resources being kind of limited. You know, science institutions don't have all the money in the world and they're losing money every year. Um, so it's falling to amateurs, so-called, um, or enthusiasts to fill in a lot of those gaps. And it turns out that's kind of how it's always worked. Um, mycology as a science was founded by amateurs in the UK uh, for the most part. Um, through Q. Uh, and I get into that history a little bit in my book. Um, this is Dr. Bryn Dentinger with his class. And uh, they're out in the Uinta Mountains um, and looking for mushrooms. And those mushrooms are identified by those students according to their morphological characteristics, their physical traits. Um, and the interesting ones are put in their fungarium. And it might look like an impressive um, space, very uh, kind of Indiana Jones meets X-Files, but uh, that cabinet in the middle and right-hand picture, it's the same cabinet, that's the fungarium at the Natural History Museum of Utah where Dr. Brinton, uh, Bryn Dentinger works. Um, pretty modest by comparison, um, but he is working with his students to find any un, uh, undocumented, and at this point that is basically all fungi in the area, um, at an institutional level at least. Uh, he's working with local uh, um, mycological society and, and other kind of enthusiast groups to try to fill this gap because that's the only way it can happen. You need people going into the woods and looking for mushrooms. And it turns out there are a lot of people who like to do that anyway. And so there's uh, a pipeline that is being kind of established uh, or various pipelines to try to move that, um, that activity into uh, real and meaningful contributions to the, the sort of formal science of mycology. And in the book, I, I get into a little bit about how that distinction is sort of breaking down. And to me, that is a good thing, um, not to throw any shade at, at science or scientists, um, but there are challenges faced by these institutions. And I see it as beneficial to everybody to enfranchise more people in the process of uh, doing science and um, building out our, our understanding of 
the natural world. Um, some of it comes down to techniques and technologies that not everyone has access to. This is a phylogeny that he's showing me um, where they are through genetic techniques, learning more about the relationships between different mushrooms. So earlier we saw mushrooms categorized by their physical uh, characteristics. Um, in this case, they're being compared and, and contrasted based on their genetic information. And it, it has shown, uh, it's basically exploding the taxonomical field in a lot of areas because we're finding out that things that look similar are actually distantly related in a process called convergent evolution or vice versa things that look very different, it turns out are actually closely related genetically. And so um, there's, there's nuance and subtlety and, and go figure uh, the story of life that is just beginning to be un, un, unpacked. And this is uh, what a phylogeny looks like um, at length. I think that's for a certain species of bolete that are found in South America and uh, Africa, the Western coast of Africa. And they're, they're working out whether there are connections based on the former, the, the fact that those two land masses used to be one. And um, so they're color coded based on the, the continent they were found on. And I just think it's, it's ridiculous <laughs> how much information there is on there. Um, but when I mentioned earlier that these technologies aren't available to everyone, that's changing. This is a genetic sequencer that is, a, and that's a USB cable. So, you know, in case the sense of scale isn't clear, you could put this in your front pocket and not worry about it. And it can do high throughput sequencing um, in the field, basically. And so uh, it's, and this is a couple of years old. I think it's probably a bit outdated at this point. Um, so these are things that people can really start. And, and I think we'll see more and more. And I, and there's another example coming up, uh, how, how basically anyone can, can get involved and do, you know, uh, meaningful work. And I, I don't like using terms like that because um, and, you know, I think meaningful involvement looks many different ways, but uh, let's say meaningful to institutions that, that, that store and, and make use of data like this. Um, if you can afford one of these and you're, you're able to learn how to use it, um, there's the possibility of doing science. And I think that's great. Um, and when I mentioned uh, X-Files earlier, it wasn't an accident. Um, this was in Dentinger's office and I, had the sense of a sort of mycological fox molder from him as someone who's working in this um, un underfunded, underappreciated corner of the natural sciences, which is itself struggling. Um, I got a kind of X-Files vibe from him. But um, on the other hand, you've got the citizens, the citizen scientists um, learning about fungi, teaching other people about fungi and working with them, um, in this case, to remediate a contaminated landscape. Um, Partly, it's really more about the education piece in this case. This is in Circle Acres near Austin, Texas. And this is a former dump. You can still see some signs of it in the background there, um, but it's being phytoremediated using plants and it's being microremediated using various different fungi. Um, but like I said, the, the education piece is really the key here. And so that's Daniel Reyes of the North Texas Myco Alliance um, showing people how fungus works, how to inoculate grains and start off your own cultivation operations, or in this case, you know, plant uh, wine caps in a garden. And that's um, a, a popular gardening mushroom uh, genus is Strafaria. Um, here they're using a kind of fugal culture, wet cardboard approach. And the idea is mitigating waste, building soil, um, and with certain mushrooms, hopefully, uptaking certain contaminants, kickstarting biodiversity. Um, fungi are really central, and maybe that's the wrong term to use because they're not at the center of anything really. They connect everything and they're, they're fundamental to processes that, um, that produce life in the soil and above it. Um, and here you see some straw bales producing, uh, producing some oyster mushrooms. And it looks like maybe a caprinus there on the right too. I didn't notice that one before. I think that might be an inky cap. Um, but this education piece is really key. This is in Brooklyn, New York at the Biotech Without Borders community lab. And that's uh, Craig Trester showing a bunch of uh, a real motley crew of just, you know, uh, people of all sorts of backgrounds um, who just came and wanted to learn about mushrooms and sat there for five hours as we we're taught about the fungal life cycle, the 
um, biology and, and uh, ecology of fungi, and also again how to how to take them home and work with them. Um, those are cardboard strips that he is demonstrating again how to inoculate, and these people took them home, um, and maybe they threw it away. In which case, it was just a little bit less cardboard um, in the trash. Maybe they could start uh, their own mushroom farm with it, or a compost bin that just eats cardboard. Um, that was the main suggestion that he was giving, but. Um, there's a lot of hope for fungi to provide for various needs and to be useful. This is the area of applied mycology, and here are some pictures from London at the uh, the uh, Art and Design of Fungi gallery show at a very nice uh, gallery called the Somerset House, where um, I, 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 well, there's a lot I could say about that. But the shoes on the left are not the best example of myco uh, materials when it comes to this stuff. If you want to see like really high grade mycelium leather, you could look at a company like Mycoworks, um, or you could look for like uh, alternative uh, shipping foam material and, and other kind of textiles. There's a company called e Ecovative that's doing amazing work. And a lot of people are really excited about that space. Um, and again, the remediation piece. So um, that whole bed of wood chips that uh, Jeff Ravage is standing on there in Colorado is uh, inoculated with oyster mushrooms. And it's part of an effort at um, testing the ability of fungi to break down the results of logging that's being done in the area to um, make the distribution of trees look more like the mosaic that it used to uh, express in, in pre-timber um, days, fire, uh, more fire resistant forest. This is a, a forest that's been decimated by intense ground fires that basically kill everything underneath them. And so they're logging in order to, in, in a pattern that, that will help encourage a, a more uh, multifarious layout of trees. And then they're taking those wood chips and their hope is to use them, uh, to inoculate them with, with wood rotting fungi. Fungi are some of the only organisms that can eat lignin and cellulose. And in so doing to kick off the, the, the trophic cycles that will spur biodiversity and, and help life return to fire scorched areas. So this is one of the few examples of microremediation that I've, I've really gotten hands on in this case, literally, and, and, uh, and uh, I think proof of, to me, a proof of concept, like that was really compelling. Um, there were piles stacked um, in ways that, that showed like the one that had been inoculated, the one he was standing on used to be, I think four feet higher than that uh, over, the, over a matter of months whereas uninoculated piles remained at their original height. Um, and there you see uh, just below the dry top layer, which is always gonna be dry, there are wood chips being eaten by these, uh, the mycelium and it's keeping moisture in the, the chips. Um, it's holding them together. So it's, it's sort of producing compost um, and also mushrooms. So there's some oyster mushrooms that he found by just uh, striking away a bit of the top layer. He was very happy that uh, bears had not eaten them yet. And again, it's always a good time to smell a mushroom. Um, here is his lab at home where he is, again, working with local strains, um, ideally within 30 miles of the lo location they'll be working with. Um, he takes them to his home lab and teases them out on agar or in, in, a, in a jar of, of a substrate like you see in the corner there and uh, then takes it to a local mushroom cultivation business um, called Mile High Fungi, where they then inoculate bags and then they put them out in the land uh, scape like you just saw. Um, so it's a partnership. Um, so that's some of the sort of practical um, hopes and, and dreams around fungi that they might help us to, to fix some of the problems we've gotten ourselves into through logging, through contamination, through um, and, and also just to provide for basic needs. Um, they're also, I think, in, as you are all well aware, inspiring a lot of social uh, insights and conversations. This is a schizophyllum commune, which is taken up as a symbol in a lot of conversations uh, about fungi as a sort of challenge to our notions of binaries. Um, these mushrooms have, I think, it's 23,000 plus mating types, which is sort of the equivalent of, of sex in, in fungi. It's 
um, that many uh, possible combinations, essentially. I'm simplifying that, but um, the idea is that it's not male or female <laughs> in the strict sense, and, and nature it doesn't always work that way. And so maybe it's no wonder that fungi are being sort of seized as a, as a communal and a, um, a paradigm challenging organism. Kind of to that note, this is Sandor Katz um, in uh, Short Mountain, Tennessee. Sandor is what I think a self-described fermentation revivalist. And um, you know, there's not a whole lot of fungi in this picture except for maybe the bagels. But um, to me, there was there was a sort of it was an example of how the the, the process that you see in an with an organism participating in or enacting can can be sort of leveled up. And to me, his kitchen, this beautiful kitchen, became a sort of fermentation vessel. Um, and of course, there is fungi involved in fermentation as well. That's tempeh that we made there. Um, it came straight out of the incubator and uh, was still alive in my hand, which is a pretty profound feeling. Um, and then we cooked it and ate it. But uh, it's the best tempeh I've ever had. And uh, yeah. Uh, there was a note there that I wish I could see right now, but um, the place was a sort of, yeah, that's, that's a, a stained glass uh, window depicting, I believe, botulism. Um, the place was a sort of church to microbes. And um, there is something inherent in thrift, in preserving food, extending value, in self uh, efficacy and also in community building and, and the, the exchange of this information between people and, and through culture um, and in partnership with life. That to me was pretty profound and, and struck at some of the, the themes of the, 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 that are coming up around fungi more generally, even though obviously bacteria is a, a major player in this context. Um, the, yeah, we hear a lot about like the radical kind of potential of fungi and of these, these practices and ideas. And to me, if there's anything radical about growing your own food or extending its value um, and working in this way, in a, in a, in a non-commodified way, then it is just by contrast to the status quo, um, which is radically out of whack in so many ways. Um, and so doing anything that's more sustainable or equitable or inclusive in the context of our status quo is, to my mind, definitionally radical. So that's how I get around the use of that term. Um, and you can see they, there is a consciousness about that. Pickle your damn self. I will ferment myself, foment fermentation. Um, these, are, these are concepts and practices that are tied with bigger issues. Um, food, life, oh, food for life, food and life. I think it's all part of the same process. And so no wonder you have things like the radical mycology convergence which is an effort at building culture and community around these principles, obviously around fungi, that's sort of the cause for the gathering, but, um, and, and citizen science plays a huge role, a lot of the sort of themes that we've touched on already. Um, this is a, the fungal distribution survey, formerly, oh, I can't remember its original name. Uh, you will know, one of you will know. Uh, but it, it's an effort at, again, recruiting people in the process of, of documenting fungal biodiversity on the back of just the existing interest in going out into the woods and finding mushrooms, which is a wonderful way to spend time. And so resources are emerging to allow people to plug that pastime into, um, again, broader scientific efforts. And that's got to be part of this mycoculture, right? And so it is. Um, but so is art making and music. Um, here is, and, and games, this is a, um, a game in which I believe they were uh, mimicking the process of cultivation. Uh, like they had to find a spore, which is like a marble in a jar of red jello. Um, that's why his hands look like that. At that moment, I was confused about what was happening. So I wasn't quite sure at the time, but um, Part of that was because I, I wasn't as fungally literate then as I was as I am now, and and a, a big part of all of this I think is to try to normalize this stuff and and make and bring people into contact with it. Um, there's a uh, an artist conk growing out of a birch person, um, and there's an example of the mycological societies uh, proliferating in all sorts of ways and places, um, even as far as. Marfa, let me see. 
I had a very slick transition here, but I'm going to have to just go hard straight into the next slide. Um, I found it, Mycotopia. There it is. Hope you've enjoyed the talk. Just kidding. Um, this is uh, Mushroom Mountain in North Carolina. This is where Trad Cotter and Olga Cotter um, run what is basically a, a kind of Willy Wonka factory uh, for uh, mushrooms. Those aren't beers, those are spawn blocks. Um, and it's also kind of a Jurassic Park, honestly, because they are experimenting with all sorts of crazy strains of mushrooms um, with like high levels of certification for like biosafety and stuff. Um, Trad on the right there often receives specimens from all over the world with weird mushrooms growing out of them. So the idea being like, if, if mushroom is growing out of a bowling ball, maybe we can cultivate that mushroom and find out how to break down old bowling balls with it. Um, and they also work with uh, medicinal mushrooms. They're, they're working on a project to um, produce novel uh, enzymes that, because fungi are incredible chemists. Um, they produce all kinds of enzymes that, that um, we aren't able to produce or that we don't even know exist. Um, many of medicinal value. And so they try um, teasing out uh, those enzymes with the idea that eventually, and this is very experimental and, and I don't think it's quite practicable yet, but it's an intriguing idea that you could inject a sample of a, say a bacterial infection that someone has into a, a, a prepared block of substrate and that the fungus would respond to that specific uh, bacterium with uh, enzymes that combat it. And then you could drain the enzymes out like literally with a syringe from that, that pocket or something like that, and then apply it in some way. It's easy to say, I don't know how, how practicable it is, but that's the sort of stuff they're working on. Um, they're also a working mushroom farm and this isn't the best picture, but I just thought this was a really cool arrangement. Um, each of those bags is perforated where it meets the next bag. So the mycelium is actually connected between every single one. And each of those is essentially a single big wall of fungus. And so they fruit at the same time. Um, just a really cool arrangement. And uh, I hadn't seen, and I, I haven't seen since anything quite like that. And I don't know why. Um, maybe there's a drawback I'm not aware of, but um, it also leads to a lot of these spent blocks. And these, I believe, ended up at a, a soup kitchen afterwards, but you can see they're just still kicking. They're still producing all sorts of mushrooms, uh, oyster mushrooms in this case, um, even as they are you know, spent, quote unquote. Um, and again, the education piece, um, the mushroom trail uh, around uh, Mushroom Mountain, where there, you know, it says there are 32 species of mushrooms that you can walk around and, and encounter. Um, I think a huge part of this is about just getting people familiar with mushrooms um, by seeing them in nature. And as you can see on the left there, that's a very righteous uh, shiitake flush that's that's happening in the in the shiitake section. Um, and on the right, you've got a cordyceps, uh, which is a little hard to see, so I zoomed in. Um, cordyceps is the little antler sticking out of the ant. Um, and I don't think I need to explain how cordyceps works to anyone here, but it's, it's basically the zombie virus and it, or a uh, fungus. And it, uh, it uh, takes over the nervous system of the ant, or I don't know if it does something similar with other insects, but compels it to climb to the highest point it can above its trail of friends and then it dies. It latches itself in place and the mushroom grows out. It's actually called a stroma and it rains spores down on the next uh, unlucky ant. Pretty ingenious. Um, that's another cordyceps. Um, this one in Pennsylvania poking out of a mossy embankment uh, next to the Susquehanna there. Or that's a tributary of it. And that is the hand of William Padilla Brown, who um, is a sort of a, a wunderkind. I don't know how to, how to describe him. He, he, he does a lot of incredible work and I'm sure many of you are familiar with him. He's 25, I think, and, and he is uh, here collecting a cordyceps um, still attached to the moth pupae, I believe, um, extracted with a knife. He's on what's called a pheno hunt. And that is looking for in this case, cordyceps, um, that he will take home and breed. Um, he will breed for 
uh, various traits that they hope to uh, emphasize, color, size, um, you know, shape. They would like to, I think, cultivate with an eye toward um, or breed with an eye toward uh, medicinal compounds because cordyceps are a, a very popular medicinal mushroom right now. They're actually just starting to become very popular here. They've been popular in parts of Asia for a long time with more their, within their weight of gold in some cases, um, different species than this one, which is Militaris, I believe. But um, these are the basis of an emerging um, nutraceutical uh, supplements, plant medicine kind of economy um, in this country. And William is one of the few, the first people in this country to work out how to cultivate them at scale. And so um, this is from Mycofest, which is where we were when we went on that hunt, a bunch of mushrooms that people found in the woods um, and a bunch of people whose tents look to me like mushrooms. Um, but also discussing the many issues of ethics and, and you know, these other social issues that we were talking about. They are trying, as they put it to me, to cultivate these mushrooms ethically and sustainably and to build these economies in ways that circulate value within their community rather than turn into these big extractive industries. Um, and so there is this growing medicinal industry and also kind of artisan industry around fungi that, that folk kids, frankly, like this are uh, leading. This is a, a sculpture of Rishi from uh, Ryan Paul Gates, which is the result of breeding and also very careful control of environmental conditions. And it's really amazing the things they're figuring out uh, that fungi can do. Um, there's William again in his lab where you see uh, equipment for PCR. He's working with liquid culture. He's about to inoculate a bunch of cordyceps and grow them in his home, his home uh, station there. Um, but this is someone who did not go to school for biology or biotechnology. I don't think he finished high school. Um, he told me he was a graduate of uh, Google Scholar and he taught himself how to do PCR uh, genetic sequencing on his own. And that's how he, he works out the breeding. He has to use PCR to, to work out the, strain, the, the mating types that he's working with. And there he is growing them out of nutrified rice instead of um, insects, which would be a lot more of a bummer. Um, but then we go straight into the social stuff. And I'm going to try to hurry through this because uh, I'm, I'm running short on time. But uh, there's really no mistaking the, the, the intention there. Um, it's connecting fungi to all of these social issues. And here you see capitalism, gender equality, environmental racism, femicide, health. It's all connected. And mushrooms are just part of the picture, you know. Um, this is the New Moon Mycology Summit in uh, Thurston, New York. Um, that's Dr. Patty Kaishian giving her, her talk on, she's a, a working mycologist. She, she gave her talk on the queer science of mycology. Um, you can notice that the, the crowd is pretty diverse. It's mostly young, it's still mostly white, um, but there was a, a notable uh, diversity and, and a centering of voices, uh, people of color and non-binary. Um, I just liked that slide. You've got mycelium saying, don't put me in a box. Uh, and again, yeah, a pretty diverse crowd comparatively to a lot of uh, spaces that I've been to. Um, but none was as um, diverse uh, in my experience as the POC fungi community. Maybe that makes sense. This was in San Diego or unceded Kumeye territory, as they would say. Um, hello from unceded Lenape Hoeking uh, territory, by the way. And uh, this was a really like the crux to me of, of kind of the, the, the threads that I was following where the mushrooms just became sort of the opportunity to gather on the terms that the community wanted to set for itself um, and to discuss the issues that were of importance to them. And also many of these issues that we've talked about, food security, medicinal sovereignty, environmental uh, contamination, they face community, they, 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 communities of color face these issues in ways that are particular to them. Um, they're more, uh, it's called environmental racism. You know, it's not a, it's not a secret, um, but somehow mushrooms have become this symbol for, for these conversations. And so, yeah, you can see a lot of that at work here. No system, but the ecosystem decolonized and there's a mushroom. Um, this is again, cordyceps uh, medicine made by our friend uh, Sneha and that's mushroom paper that she made it with. And again, an example of like, medicine made by the community, circulating within the community. That's the World Beat Cultural Center I alluded to earlier. Um, 
And here I'll close out with my trip to Ecuador, which um, to me was sort of the, the other piece of that kind of final realization, um, which isn't final by any means, but um, it's that when we're pointing to these problems, we can't look to mushrooms to solve them for us. You know, this is in Ecuador in Sucumbios where Texaco, uh, formerly Texaco, now Chevron spilled billions of gallons of wastewater and millions of gallons of oil uh, into the rainforest which they say has been cleaned up, but obviously it has not. Um, they lost a lawsuit um, and just refused to acknowledge it. It's, that's a whole story I encourage anyone who's interested to look into. Um, but the legacy is this, a contaminated landscape um, where, of course, mushrooms are still kicking and that's been the source of a lot of hope that they might play a role in cleaning up um, these contamination, all of this contamination. Um, Lexi Gropper right there, um, went there with that in mind as part of the micro renewal project, the Amazon micro renewal project, which she's no longer associated with because after moving there full time, falling in love with the country and with her now husband and making it her life, she's, she's become more interested in, in a kind of social remediation. Um, these are medicines that she makes from mushrooms and it's only for the cancer patients in the area who um, there are many more cancer patients as a result of these um, you know, spills and other medical consequences. And they don't sell these um, outside of Ecuador, as she put it to me, enough has been extracted from Ecuador. It's really just a, a means of supporting the community. Um, and we can get into that if anyone has any questions about it. But um, the move has gone away from finding the fungus that'll eat this contaminant or uptake this heavy metal and become one of how do we equip the community to recognize what healthy soil even looks like using simple, nuanced and, and sophisticated, but at the end of the day, visual and, and, and accessible techniques to assess soil health. And so she and her, her team have, have begun these, uh, these programs of uh, traveling fairs, of uh, a kind of passport system to encourage people to travel between different farms that are practicing different um, methods of soil remediation and, and just assessing health. And turning to the people um, rather than the mushrooms to solve the problem, um, which to me is sort of the, the crux of this. Like when we ask, can mushrooms save the world? I think we're asking if they can save the world for us. And um, mushrooms are gonna be here no matter what we do. I think they've been here for over a billion years. They're gonna be fine no matter how we manage ourselves and our planet. But um, it's, uh, if, they, if, if they're gonna help us save the world and I think they can, ultimately that's up to us. And uh, that to me is sort of the, the message of the mushroom. Um, and that's all I've got. So I hope I didn't go too far over time. And thank you for listening. Yeah, thank you. No, it was perfect. Um, thank you so much for joining us and all your information. You obviously know everything, you know, you've been putting so much okay. effort into it. You, you don't need your notes. <laughs> oh. um, you definitely got it through. So yeah, thank you. Um, I encourage anybody who has a question to please put it in the chat. Um, and we will um, get get to them. Um, I was gonna have, um, well, I'll just see a, a few things about it too. Um, first of all, I'm glad that you were here in San Diego as well. Um, I was in that, um, the POC fungi festival as well. Um, so, yeah, well, I have missed you, but um, yeah, you know, we're trying to support all the, all the mushroom culture. Um, but so I'm really glad that we made a part of it. Um, the other thing too is um, you had a bunch of pictures or so that they were awesome because it really, even somebody commented that it's really good to, um, put you know these pictures into perspective although you do a really good job in the book to really paint a, a picture that we're kind of there with you um going through all these things so it's really engaging so definitely recommend the book um and you we've had a lot of people that you had mentioned as well um like um uh, alan rockefeller a lot of the stuff that you did with the british um fungi festival we have a natural history museum so part of the i naturalist we've actually um have submitted some we have our own little fungus um area at the natural history museum although it is tiny 
and Alan Rockefeller helped us identify some of those funguses there. Um, so it's really cool to see the behind the scenes of all aspects of it. And we've also had some of the, uh, we've had Olga come talk to us from uh, Smugtown. We've had Ecovative come and talk to us. Um, last week was Joshua English who talked a little bit more about that um, using our, the mycelium for um, architecture. So we have put up a lot of um, information. So this kind of like this book kind of helps bring a lot of things together, which is really cool. Um, I personally really like to say that I love um, what you said at the end about, uh, you know, mushrooms teach us a lot. And that's kind of like when we're trying to say like from all different aspects, like whatever vantage point or angle you're doing, but really what one of the main things that should be taught is what healthy soil looks like. Um, the mycelium, yes, it's going to help the soil get healthy, but we need to know what healthy soil is and what it's not and really help um, having people identify it so we know where the effort should be made if we're really trying to kind of help clean society and um, turning mushrooms to save the world, but you're right, it's really to save us um, and our world that we're doing since we're breaking it down so uh, so quickly these days. So hopefully some of these techniques will take off and especially as more and more people are um, looking into mushrooms, there's gonna be more ways that everybody can be involved. So um, I really appreciate that whole big aspect of it uh, that you talked. Um, Let's see. Um, one of the other things too, you know, you talked about there's tons of different ways to get involved. And one of them is through the festival scene. So yes, there is the Telluride in Colorado. Um, there is also NAMA is actually going to be holding their foray. So they're a, nat a normal um, national foray for the North American Mycological Association. And that's going to be a week, uh, I believe, right after um the telly ride so more people are maybe are likely to go but now we have like the myco fest and radical mycology and there's soma camp so there's tons of them so i encourage people if that's one of the ways you like to get involved there's festival app for for you out there um now i'm gonna answer some um questions that were answered um They've been, Brianna has been looking for somewhere to volunteer in micro remediation. Um, you have any suggestions or if anybody from the club has any suggestions about micro remediation and where to find them. I, I'll just get my, my response out of the way, I guess, because I, I couldn't speak for the situation in San Diego really, um, but I would, I would think that they're Plenty of people there. I certainly saw. I think Yapsi Gomez was his name at um, at uh, the PSU Fungi Community. He was working with micro remediation in a community garden nearby, and I, I think there's probably a lot of opportunities um, through the PSC Fungi Community. At least I, I heard a lot of conversations about projects and things like that. So maybe someone there can can direct you to a local uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and Mario, who runs it, is um, they're on it. So using Instagram to talk to them, or they will respond. Brianna, yeah, a great follow too. Yeah, um, I would also just add, um, incidentally, that uh, again, uh, I think working with them at home, cultivating them, is a great way to to begin getting the ball rolling in that way. Um, there's some of the examples in the slideshow you saw people like just digesting cardboard. Uh, with it. And so I think maybe just like a home level, um, that's another opportunity. But as far as specific stuff in, in the area, I, I'd have to defer. Um, yeah, we've held a few uh, pre-COVID. We had some cultivation classes uh, by Sam Andrasco and um, as well as Dennis Shardman helped. Um, and we did a lot of like the home cultivation. So we had the cardboard and uh, we did the shiitake logs and the strafaria uh, gardens um, and oyster mushrooms. So 
we'll see if we can have one of those I'll wait in person but um yeah there's been cultivation and i don't know if anybody here is doing tiger milk mushrooms so if anybody knows um feel free to put it in the chat i i'm not sure about that one um and does any does anybody else have any other question um, what is the most effective and accessible education practice you witnessed? Hmm. Great question. Yeah, I mean, honestly, well, I, I kind of mentioned the, the sort of emerging like people's pedagogy or you know, people's fungal pedagogy that seems to be, a, a, I actually, I think that was something in my notes that I didn't talk about. Uh, there's, there's a certain vocabulary that's just emerging and a lot of these classes kind of follow the same uh, arc and they hit a lot of the same notes, you know, fungal biology and, and ecology, the applications that are, are, you know, really promising around them, um, the cultivation and, uh, and also the practical hands-on aspect. So, um, I think those are, are the, 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 what are the, what's the word I'm looking for? The, the mainstays of the practice because for a reason, um, people are interested in fungi as, as a, a unique and new form of life. They're enticed by all of the potential applications that get revealed. Um, they, I think, like to, will probably be curious about eating them and growing them. And so the hands-on aspect, I think, connects a lot of the information that's, that seems sort of abstract and, and um, uh, again, otherworldly even to, to people who haven't interacted with it before and makes it real and tangible. Um, so I guess it's a long way of saying like the way that I, I see people doing these classes where people are showing up out of just an interest or a curiosity where they don't even know anything about it. Um, and following that sort of formula seems to be a pretty good one. Um, and I think that's why it's being replicated kind of spore-like you might say uh, throughout the country. At least that's what I've observed. Um, and actually I saw an example of it uh, in uh, Canada as well. So I, I think it's a, um, I think it's a durable sort of framework. I guess where you could like find an example of that. Um, gosh, I would look to like fungi for the people um, in uh, Oregon. They've got, uh, I mean, I'm not sure what kind of resources they have right now for um, equipping other people to do this stuff, but that's kind of their whole thing is like making this stuff public and, and, and spreading the spores. Um, I really wanted to talk to, to them uh, for this book, but unfortunately it wasn't possible for, for various reasons, which is a shame because they're a linchpin in, in, their, in this, uh, this picture. So look to fungi for the people, PSC fungi community. I think they, they're taking up that um, uh, model and applying it to their local and, and their own community, their local situation and their community, your community. Um, and uh, yeah, I hope that's helpful, but I'm guessing you probably are already aware of some of that. Um, but I think it's, uh, to answer the question, the most effective thing is, I think, just playing to the, the curiosity people have into giving them the information, the context, and the hands-on um, engagement with fungi itself. Yeah, get your hands in that soil. Yeah. That's right. Um, awesome. Yeah, it's definitely contagious. <laughs> um, oh, there's so many answers to Brianna as well. Just look up bioremediation. Um, yeah. They'll find stuff. Um, yeah, there's tons of stuff. Good. Well, thank you. If there's any last pending questions, please um, let us know. Um, but I really want to thank you, Doug, for taking the time to meet up with us. Um, this is one thing about like Zoom, at least, where we're able to um, to talk to people all over the world. And we're also really happy that you got your book done before all of this started, so you can actually meet everybody in person. So again, this is, um, if you guys haven't read the book or gotten in, again, remember that you guys get a 35% off. Uh, through the Chelsea Green Publishing, and um, it's it's a really great read. You can even like take it in like specific chapters, 
um, to kind of like absorb because there is a lot of information in here, but it's it's done in a way that is really digestible. And like I had said before, he kind of like takes you with him, you know, so you're just kind of like there um, as he's going and meeting all these people and really getting to understand what the fascination that these people bring to the world of fungus. So some of them have been doing it for just a few years and some of them have been doing it um, for decades. So it's a really um, a good collaboration of them. So um, I really highly recommend it. Um, it's a great book. <laughs> um, and for everybody else, um, we decided that um, because we haven't been meeting in person, we are gonna continue to do our monthly Monday meetings um, to at least meet once a month. If we can do, we're, we'll send you information about other events that we're doing, but um, our next one is still not um, for sure who's gonna do it, but we're gonna see you on June 7th, which is the next um, monthly uh, Monday of the month. And to, um, so please join us then. It's gonna be the same. We'll send some information and you'll register. It's gonna be over Zoom. Um, and as far as for this weekend, happy Mother's Day um, to all the moms out there. So celebrating, um, I'm Mexican, so I'll actually be celebrating uh, May 10th, which is Mexican Mother's Day. Um, and everybody else gets to celebrate the 9th. But um, we really appreciate it everybody, all the moms out there who have um, raised phenomenal kids. Um, hopefully you'll be teaching them a little bit more about mushrooms so they can grow up and also be uh, mushroom files and want to save the environment because that's one of the reasons that we're also doing this for. So um, the last little things we have uh, YouTube channel um, where you can watch our fungus fair um, and a few other kind of like snippets of what we have. We are not, we haven't done too many, but we're hopefully we'll get a few more done. And um, one of the other things is, oh, thank you. Um, if there's anything else. Um, oh, yes, this is it. Like I said, one of the things that we love is uh, both foraging for mushrooms. So like, again, it rained yesterday. So hopefully in a few days, we'll hopefully see a few. So let us know. But it was also yesterday was National Truffle, the National Truffle Day. So it was for the chocolates. But really, they came out because they're like a ball of chocolate rolled in more chocolate and then powdered with chocolate to make it look like um, the truffles. So we paired up with Angel Salumi, and they're also giving us 10% off. So any uh, products, any truffle products. So they have butters and uh, sausages and salamis and all sorts of um, amazing things. So I eat them all the time. So if you're interested in uh, truffles, go ahead and check them out. And then uh, for everybody else, enjoy today's Cinco de Mayo. Remember, Chelsea has their last, um, and their sale that goes on for until May 5th. So I hope you guys can um, join everybody there. And um, yeah, thank you so much. And if there's anything else, please let us know. And thank you again. Uh, he saw, um, Jeff just put in his um, his email address. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to reach out for him. And um, thank you guys again. Thank you, Doug, and everybody that joined us tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Take good care. See okay. ya. I do it. Mm -hmm. There we go.